Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the September 23rd special meeting of the Rochester Planning Commission. I would like to, at this point, ask the clerk to call the roll. All right, Chairman McGee? Here. Vice Chair Lord? Not here. Mayor Bixon? Here. Council Member Sage? Here. Members Clark Martin? No. Not, uh, not here. Here. Okay. Hauser? Here. King? Here. Stone? Not here. We haven't heard from him, but maybe he'll show up. Uh, before we begin, folks, this is uh, Christine, tell me if I got it right, Wanfried? Courtney Courtney. Wanfried. Courtney. Yeah. Our new recording <laughs> secretary. We we heard you in person last meeting, but now we get to see you. So, again, welcome aboard. Nice to have you. Thank you. It's okay. nice to be here. <laughs> okay. Uh, please join me with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America, America. America. and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Uh, next item is uh, public comment, and I'll ask Sienna or Courtney if you have anything written or uh, anyone waiting to speak to us tonight relative to public comment. We do not. Thank you, Sienna. Okay, number four, considerations. A, consideration of a site plan to build an inspection packaging and warehouse building. Par Pharmaceutical, located at 870 Parkdale. Just remind everyone this was on the last agenda and we did held we did hold the required public hearing just for the record and uh, tonight is further discussion about several of the items that were raised at the last meeting uh, video thank you mr chairman members of the commission as chairman mcgee mentioned this project was before you on your september 7th planning commission meeting and a public hearing was held the request is from Power Pharmaceutical Company to build a 90,160 square foot warehouse and packaging building on their existing campus of Parkdale Road. The use is a principal permitted use in the RP, which is the Research Park District. The proposed structure complies with all of the height and the setback requirements for the district. With regard to vehicle access, I will pull up the site plan. Uh, if I could be given uh, sharing, screen sharing abilities, I would be able to share it. Um, the site has a network of access drives with a single major access drive leading into the site of Parkdale. No changes to it are proposed. This particular warehouse is located on the south side of the site, southwest approximately. Video, we and don't, we don't have the visual yet. Ah, okay, it's coming up on my screen now. Just one second, please. I am not sure why. I'm not able to see. Just give me one second, please. Let me pull up the... Okay, I have the screen on here. And I'm... Okay, here we go. All right. Can everybody see my screen? Yeah, we got it. Thank you. Okay. So uh, the proposed warehouse building is located on the southwest corner approximately of the site. It is going to be con connected with an internal network of drives. All of the access drives are 24 feet wide as required by our ordinance and are compliant. The applicant has submitted a truck circulation diagram. This area circulation is meant for fire trucks and they have provided a diagram which shows that the proposed site is navigable. For the applicant, this building is not going to result in any net increase in traffic to the site because it's not creating any new jobs. In fact, this facility will relocate 70 of the employees from the existing buildings into this warehouse facility. So the number of trips in and out of the site of Parkdale for trucks or employees is going to remain unchanged. There is no existing sidewalk along the site's Parkdale Road frontage, and this is an existing situation. Due to the secure nature of the facility, um, a sidewalk has not been previously required in front of Power or Pfizer Pharmaceuticals. There is an existing sidewalk on the north side of Parkdale Road, and it has been deemed as adequate for providing pedestrian circulation in this area. The plan does include a seven foot wide sidewalk on the north side of the warehouse building. Uh, there is a new sidewalk propo crosswalk proposed 
with sidewalk connections to an existing crosswalk that connects to the other buildings on the site. My letter says no new crosswalks were proposed in this. I looked at one of the other architectural site plan sheets. As I look at this sheet, I would like to amend the comment to say that crosswalks are being provided through pavement striping to facilitate pedestrian access. The applicant had previously mentioned that their intent is to keep this particular facility operationally and functionally more isolated from the rest of the facilities. With regard to off-street parking, based on the ordinance standards, a total of 93 spaces are required for this new warehouse. A total of 111 spaces are being provided. All of the spaces meet ordinance standards. The ordinance requires all paved areas to be concrete curb. And this is where we had our major discussion last meeting and um, I had concerns about waiving the curbing requirement for this facility. After the meeting, I had an opportunity to speak with the applicant and um, I understood that the applicant had misunderstood the requirement as listed in our letter. When I said concrete curbing is required, I meant only in the area of disturbance, only the new area of construction. The requirement for curbing was not applicable to any of the existing sites. You thought it was site. the whole campus. At this, Got it. Yes, we too. were not talking about adding uh, curbing anywhere along the existing drives or parking lot. That is an existing situation. They are not touching it. We are not asking for curbing. We are only asking that the new area that is being constructed comply with the ordinance, which is exactly what the engineer also intended. Upon speaking with the applicant, the applicant said they have no problem doing that. They just understood our comment to mean that we were expecting the entire site to be built. That was not the requirement. They were previously proposing a curb up till here and along this whole area. At this time, they have extended the curb till here, covered this landscape island, and provided curbing along this side, along this side. And that is acceptable and in keeping with the ordinance standards. I will zoom into a closer version of the site plan. Um, if the planning commission could see this, I'm going to zoom in a little bit more. Computer is a bit slow in zooming in. If you look at this, if you look at this access drive, it does show bank parking on either side. The applicant is not intending to construct it at this time. There is an area marked for future development. There is no timeline for it at the present time, but sometime in the future, PAR will uh, expand and build a structure over here, and they're hopeful of providing parking in this area. It does not make sense to put curbing that needs to then be ripped out in order to accommodate development here. The applicant was amenable to putting curbing only on one side, and the city's engineer is also um, amenable to that provided this area is graded to drain appropriately into the pavement and then into their stormwater detention system. So at this point of time, if you look at this plan, the heavier black line shows you where all the curbing is going to be. And this is exactly what we were requiring in our initial letter too. So at this time, we believe the plan is compliant in providing the curbing as required by the ordinance. With regard to architecture, the applicant has provided detailed elevations. I will go to sheet 37. So the applicant has provided elevations, which shows the building constructed of split face block and standing seam metal roof. And this is the various views. This is their employee area with umbrellas and picnic tables. This is the office area and the rest of it is the warehouse. This is the south side of the building with the only loading docks for uh, the warehouse access. At the last meeting, another point of discussion was what is the view of this building going to be from Letica and from the OPC parking lot? Subsequent to the meeting, I discussed with the applicant and explained what exactly is required to be submitted and at this time that has been provided. This is exactly what was being required initially too a cross-section diagram from Letica across OPC, across their parking lot, showing the farm building and the proposed warehouse building. If you now see from where Letica's grade is at 760 feet, where the OPC is all the way down to the new warehouse, the drop is approximately 40 feet. So at no point of time will anything be visible straight in a line of sight from OPC building or Letica Avenue and 
if you come to this edge, you're going to be able to see only the roof of the building and there is really nothing you can do any different with a roof. The applicant did previously clarify that they are not going to have any rooftop mechanical equipment. So at this time, the main concern we had with regarding how this proposed warehouse is going to appear from Letica and Parkdale has been addressed. As you can see on this particular aerial view, Parkdale is all the way up here. So the building is placed south enough that it's not going to be visible from Parkdale, especially with all this vegetation in the way. <coughs> the applicant has also provided a landscape plan on... Uh, let me just take you to the landscape plan so you can you can see this is the landscape plan proposed by the applicant and the addition of all these trees, this property belongs to OBC. So they are putting in as many trees as they can along the periphery. These represent existing and proposed trees and this should provide adequate screening to the proposed building. There is no new signage proposed at this time. A photometric plan is shown with wall-mounted and pole-mounted lights with downward-directed fixtures. A landscape um, a tree removal plan has been submitted and proposed replacement trees are being included on the plan based on the caliper count. The city's forester has confirmed that there are no landmark trees on the site. With regard to trash removal, there is a trash compactor and that is proposed on the southeast corner of the building. So there's going to be no separate enclosure. Another point of discussion at the last meeting was the sustainability evaluation. When the applicant initially did their sustainability evaluation, they scored 4.5 out of 20 indicator points. And the reason for that was most of the item indicator points, the applicant had not provided any information for us to evaluate whether they are meeting the criteria or not meeting the criteria. After the meeting at our one-on-one uh, -on -one meeting with the applicant, I went over each of the criteria one by one, and the applicant has at this time provided the required information, and their revised score was 15 points on 20, which deems the project sustainable under the Sustainable Rochester proposal. Based on a review of the project submitted at this time, it is our recommendation that the Planning Commission grant site plan approval to the proposed Par Pharmaceuticals, a warehouse and packaging building to be located at 870 Parkdale. I would be happy to answer any questions you might have. So I'd ask the commissioners if you have any questions for the planner. Uh, good job, uh, Par, and good job, Vidya. You, recover, or you covered many of the concerns that we had two weeks ago. I just had one um, question. There was, back in the landscape plan, there was that row of trees between an OPC building, I believe you said, and the PAR Pharmaceutical. Is that the barn, or what building is that? That cutout video, is that the historic barn yeah. that, mm -hmm. yeah, that's okay. what it is. Okay. No, that, that's not really the barn building. That's just showing you the OPC building. The barn building is further up here. This is just showing you the property boundary lines. Gotcha. The barn, the barn building will be further somewhere over here. This down, is their landscape the, plan. Yeah. They're just showing their property boundary lines. The barn is not immediately adjacent to their property line. If you go to, uh, let me go to sheet 37. If I go to sheet 38, you can see that there is still some distance between the barn and them. So the barn is over here, and this would be all the, the distance to the proposed warehouse. There will be distance, and there will be landscaping along this area. Okay, so between there, that's still partially OPC land. Yeah, correct. And, yes. And I, we don't have the, the minutes yet um, from the last meeting. Can you remind me what there were plans for this barn? The, the director of the uh, OPC said that she hoped to someday extend their program into those buildings. Yeah, I, I think they want to make that, Mr. Chairman, that they want to make it into an event potential to have concerts and dances and use that uh, as potential way to gain some revenue and stuff. But I think that's a down, 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 down long road. range plan. Okay. <clears throat> I believe the applicant did approach and reach out to OPC after the meeting in order to share their plans with the OPC representative again and explain what they are doing. Um, no so we, have, uh, plans for the we have no further communication from OPC then? Renee, I believe it was the, the woman's name. A court, right? Uh, yes. Sianna, uh, did we hear anything else from OPC? Um, I believe that Brian actually met with 
uh, Renee, and they okay. were they basically solved everything. Just a minute, Brian. I'm correct. Get you up here. Nick, are you a part of that conversation? Brian, come on, come on up. Since that's a hot subject. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, it's Nick. Yeah, Brian called me after him and Renee talked, and then Renee texted me and said they worked everything out. Just uh, a little misunderstanding, so they're all good to go. Yeah, good evening, Brian Kistner, Senior Director of Engineering Services at Park Pharmaceutical. So we did meet with Renee and the, the Chief Financial Officer with the OPC a few days after, and there's no further comments that uh, we received from Renee and or the team at OPC. So now they understand the nature of it and how yeah. close. Yeah. Okay. And we did show, pr present the, the, the schematic view to show that uh, very good. there's no... Those are very helpful. Yeah. Yes. Brian, why don't you stay there? Does anyone have any questions for Parr, for Brian? David? I have a few questions, but it really isn't directly to you, but since you're there, you might need to respond. First, I'd say I um, appreciate the response document that addressed what I was concerned about, especially the geometrics on the emergency vehicle movement through the site, so I made it very clear. Um, looking at the north elevation where the entry is, the, where the barrier-free parking spots are, I see how I'm sorry, David. Can you can you move your mic so we can hear you better, please? Yes, thank you. Uh, I, thank you. I just turned it on. Um, yep. Should Point I it repeat you, that? David. Point it towards you. Should yeah, I then repeat it. Okay, I'll start with where I was beginning with my comments. So on the north side of the building, where the barrier-free parking is, basically the entry. I see what you've done, which I really think is a great, simple way and most convenient for those that need it. The Paving is aligned with the drive along those uh, five or six spot, five spots, but there aren't wheel stops, so that just tends to make it less guided. So I would appreciate wheel stops at those spots since okay. the sidewalk won't do that. And then there's an interesting thing um, at the entry. It looks like a fenced corral or some kind of security something, and um, the portion that leads right up to what I think is the, the entry point is sloped, and the slope goes right to the point where it looks like they'd be crossing through a gate or a door, and that generally is a difficult thing for someone that has mobility issues. Um, so to, to address the, the uh, uh, turnstile entering into the building, that we need the turnstiles for security purposes, so we can badge in, badge out of the building, because the, the type of products we do make were required by the DEA to have uh, several barriers to entry into the building. Um, the security of that building will still be at our main security hut, if, you, if you're familiar with the campus, and it'll be remote monitored with cameras and, and badge access. And they'll be level going into the building, so. Is there um, someone in a wheelchair or something like that? Can, they can't get through the turnstile. We will have a separate gate uh, adjacent to the turnstile for accessibility for turn for handicap accessible. And that's the thing I was just referring to. It, it, it shows like a door would normally show, and it's in that paved area. But if you, that hatched area, I don't want to see SP5. There's a hatched area that leads right from the barrier-free parking right up to that door or gate. And it's based on the elevations indicated. It shows a rise right up to the threshold of that gate, which okay. is generally not a, a good thing for someone that needs, you know, some ease of movement that has mobility challenges. I would suggest that you look at that again just to eliminate some potential issue for someone that might need to get through that. If they need to go through the gate, they're going to potentially have an issue. We'll, we'll take that into consideration, make sure it's uh, it's safe for all access. Yeah, you either back the ramp off or move the gate, one of those okay. two. There's really the only <laughs> two options. All right. That was it for me, Mr. Chairman. Everything else, uh, like I said, when I started, I thought it was a very appreciated response to our comments from last Very week. much so. Nice catch, David, as always. You see things I don't see. Any other Gentlemen, questions? For yes, Vidya. Uh, I just wanted to respond to Commissioner Gasson. The reason why wheel stops have not been provided is typical sidewalk width required is five feet. Par is providing seven foot wide sidewalks. So that will provide for two feet vehicle overhang and then a five foot sidewalk. So wheel stop really is not necessary because even with vehicle overhang, the sidewalk will be barrier-free accessible. There'll be more than enough room for it. Mr. Chairman, if I could respond. Please. Uh, um, I don't think the planner understood what I was saying. That section right where the barrier-free spots are, if you look at the elevation marks, the parking 
pavement surface is aligned with the walk surface equally, and then, which is great. Oh, it's at the grade. Okay. At grade. So in that case, you do need the wheel stops because the pavement won't stop the car. Yes. I was under the impression this was a barrier-free ramp being provided, but if there's no ramp and this is all at grade, then yes, wheel stops would help protect the yeah. sidewalk. Yeah, I think this is the preferred method for those that need to get out of a car and onto a walkway. This is a much better situation. Directly to the sidewalk Direct. at grade with the car. Yeah, much better. Okay. Yeah. The rest of our campus is set up that way with the wheel stops. So we'll... we'll You'll we'll, revisit that? Yes, we will. Okay. You all set with that video? Yes, thank you. Okay. Any other questions for Brian while he's up here? Any other questions for the planner? Okay. Uh, this has already been through a public hearing, so uh, I believe all of our concerns have been met. So if uh, if someone's interested in making a motion, we would like to hear that. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mayor. I will make a motion that we approve this site plan approval as presented tonight. And is there support? Mr. Chairman, I'd like to support with the caveat that the wheel stops and the ramp at the gate entry would be addressed. Okay, you okay with that, Mr. Mayor? Absolutely. Okay, Thank so you. we have a motion. Mr. Mayor. Motion and support. Any other discussion? Uh, the roll call, please. Chairman McGee? Yes. Vice Chairman Lord? Not here. Mayor Bixon? Yes. Council Member Sage? Yes. Members Clark Martin? Not here. Uh, Gasson? Yes. Hauser? Yes. King? Yes. And Stone? Abstain. Absent. Thank you very much. Uh, Brian? Abstain, not absent. Uh, he abstained. Okay. Yeah. You you got that? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Thank he, you. He had abstained earlier because of a uh, potential business conflict. Brian, thank you very much. We wish you the best. We're very proud to have you here, and good luck with the project. Thank you, guys. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, item four B: consideration of an ordinance amendment to section twenty one twenty five regarding fencing standards. Attorney Craig. Yes, thank you. Uh, before you for consideration is a pretty um, straightforward uh, proposed ordinance amendment to section 2125, which is the city's um, zoning ordinance for fen with fence standards. Uh, this issue came about because the city uh, inspector was, um, or the building official was uh, asked to approve a plan that uh, included an in-ground swimming pool but did not have a four-foot fence. Um, when that was brought to the attention, they said, well, the international swimming pool and spa code did not require uh, such barrier or fencing if the pool has a, uh, a powered safety cover, which this one did. Um, that was um, a, a bit <laughs> unusual, and so we brought these these matters forward to city council to see. Um, there's actually there was another um, <coughs> ordinance, uh, not a zoning code, just a regular code ordinance um, that we proposed and the city council passed. Which, um, while the city adopts the international swimming pool code, uh, we did carve that out and said, uh, well, regardless of what that provision said, we require. Uh, fences regardless of that whether there's a powered safety cover um, So then when we were doing that we also said well Hey, there's a fence ordinance in the zoning code that we should probably update as well And so that is what's before you the only changes to the zoning code uh, Would specifically require properties with outdoor swimming pools including those with powered safety covers uh, to meet all um, ordinance requirements for fencing and barriers at all times um, and then also, uh, as this uh, body knows, the Zoning uh, Board of Appeals does have some appeal discretion uh, if something was brought before it, and so we wanted to not have them have that ability to overrule uh, or to grant a variance on that uh, item. So in section, uh, subsection three, we specifically took that ability out uh, from the uh, ZBA. So the, since this is a zoning uh, ordinance, it had to come uh, before this body, before city council can act on it. 
and procedurally uh, if Planning Commission is ready to move forward with this uh, uh, small amendment then the process would be to uh, set this matter the request would be to set this matter for a public hearing which is required for zoning ordinances and then uh, if after the uh, uh, public hearing then it could be referred to uh, City Council for action questions for the attorney seems pretty straightforward is the uh, the applicant with the cover going to cooperate with us um, the applicant does not need to have the fence because the the code didn't require it at the time that's what I was so thinking. I don't know um, I didn't, haven't heard whether or not they're going to or not but they specifically didn't want, did not want to which is they they said they didn't want that so they had the powered safety cover so looks like we have one pool that would not meet uh, a four-foot fence so um, I don't know administratively Nick can we try to work with these folks and get their cooperation I mean yeah, Randy and I met with them and at this point they're not cooperating but we'll keep trying okay tomorrow's another day it is yeah, they are Go ahead, Matt. Just wondering if they are the only mm -hmm. one that will be non-conforming at this yeah, point. Yeah, they beat the system. Yeah, it's a pretty good loophole they yeah. found. Yeah, it it's is. impressive, really. Somebody found it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But It'll we still dangerous. like their cooperation. Is there any concern about hot tubs as well? Uh, that would also, uh, to the extent that hot tubs have to have one, this would be covered. I don't remember specifically if, because um, they don't call them, uh, I forget the, the, the title they use for it, but to the extent that they had to otherwise, they would have to here as well. But I, I, I know that, um, you know, that, that's a good question. I'll, I'll have that answer for you uh, when it comes back, if it does move forward for the public hearing. Okay. okay. Yeah, Jeff, I think if most hot tubs are above ground, so if they're over 30 inches, they don't need a, a fence around them, but if they're sunk in the ground, I still think they do. So, but we can, yeah. we'll, we'll certainly get that answer for sure. So would anyone object to moving this forward? Our next step is to create a public hearing for this? Correct. And considering that uh, you need at least 15 days, uh, you won't make your uh, October. October 4th, so the next available planning commission meeting. Would Someone would like to make that motion? So moved. Okay. Moved by Mr. Gasson. How about support? Support. Support by Mr. Stone. Any other questions? Okay. The roll call, please. Chairman McGee? Yes. Mayor Bixen? Yes. Council Member State Sage? Yes. Member Gasson? Yes. Hauser? Yes. King? Yes. And Stone? Yes. Thank you very much. Appreciate the administration's attempt to work with these people if you can. Uh, 4C, consideration of an ordinance amendment to section 2306 regarding light and illumination. I'll kick that one off too. Um, before you again is the uh, proposed ordinance amendment uh, for discussion, uh, which is section 2306. Um, as uh, I'll take you into the Wayback Machine, this was uh, brought by administration uh, for consideration. Uh, to re the, the proposed change was to remove the specific prohibition against seeing light sources and bare bulb illumination in the lighting ordinance. And the reason for that was enforceability. Um, it, if you if you look around the city, there are um, uh, you know bare bulb or you know the source of light uh, that is seen everywhere. Um, the the city also has a light strength uh, requirement of one foot candle limitation and uh, talking to uh, the one who enforces this which is the fire department our fire chief um, he has used the we, we refer to as the lito meter um, there's a there's a proper name for it but that's what we would call it um, and that is more of an objective uh, um, objective standard uh, that's you know uh, that does measure at five feet above the ground and uh, that's at this point deemed to be um, sufficient or advisable uh, when it comes to enforcement um, this uh, Planning Commission um, looked at this uh, earlier this year and um, there was a suggestion to try to work with um, the I'll call it the offending neighboring properties uh, to see if, if just voluntary compliance could be obtained 
and uh, the, the apartments uh, near uh, Great Oaks. Um, my understanding is that it did bring those lights into, I'm not going to say compliance, but they shielded the lights so that that uh, shining issue was no longer an issue. Um, so it's now uh, actually city council also then picked it up because uh, there was a resident that was uh, said okay but we also have residential to residential issues that we should address as well um, so city council took a look um, at the the same ordinance and the same grouping of uh, other communities ordinances that i've included in this packet which were the same ones that you saw before and uh, rather than, in, in, to the extent that um, City Council wanted to provide input to Planning Commission or give their comments, because all ordinance amendments for zoning have to start here. Um, so City Council, I, I listed uh, items one through six. I went back and reviewed the video of the Planning Commission, excuse me, the City Council meeting where that this matter was discussed, and I, and I laid forth, uh, or set forth the, um, the comments. So really at this point, uh, where are we? Uh, we are at the point where uh, Planning Commission um, is requested to provide input to the administration to see what it is, if any changes, uh, to the lighting ordinance it wishes to see. Uh, the ordinance amendment uh, that is before you uh, still uh, does uh, delete the prohibition against bare bulb or source illumination and also um, an improvement um, that was made or a request that was made uh, from actually uh, at the request of former Planning Commission member Bavacqua uh, was a, to add a sunset provision. Uh, so there was, there's a concern with, um, this is dealing with the uh, commercial and multiple family uh, lighting that the, um, for existing lights that, are, that would no longer, that, that would be a problem, they would have up to a year to bring it into compliance. Um, and I, I believe that that was uh, specifically commented on at the last city council meeting uh, back in, I think it was back in June, uh, as a positive uh, change to allow uh, people to change out from commercial and uh, multiple family dwellings uh, to require a downward shielded so light doesn't show on windowed, si windowed sides of residential homes. Um, so that, that language is in there uh, in subsection 3 small b as well so at this point I, I, I believe administration and I uh, would be comfortable with the the it as is but if City Council or excuse me Planning Commission wishes to have additional discussion uh, on other changes or to remove the changes that we're proposing we're, we're here to listen and and be responsive to you Christian just a, from a basic proposition are we talking Commercial, multifamily, residential, is it all of these or is it excluded? Because I, I think for me personally, I need to understand what we're dealing with in the context of how this is going to apply to property owners. If I may. So the, the, um, the required shielding, um, that is set forth in that uh, section B, uh, which is the uh, section 3B, uh, that's, that pertains to exterior lighting from commercial buildings and multiple family dwellings, so uh, apartments, um, in any district that abuts a single family um, dwelling in a residential district. So this would, not, this would not create a requirement for house to house shielding requirement, okay. if I can just no, that's, that's, talk plainly. That's, no, that's exactly yeah. what I needed to understand. So it's just strictly from commercial or multifamily to residential, but not vice versa, or alternatively, residential to residential. Correct. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Have we surveyed how many buildings this would impact? <clears throat> Chief, you want to join us up here? <clears throat> Probably a no. <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of like my mom asking me if I was going to go someplace. <laughs> um, thank you. If you take a look at uh, kind of the history of, of Rochester, we have not had very many new apartment buildings built or multifamily or commercial. So many of the, the lights that are out there right now are non-conforming. 
So I don't have an honest number to be able to say it's 47 or 52. But they've been there for years. But they've been there for years. And so to that point, what, what we have always tried to do is work with the property owners when we've had a complaint. Um, and so far we have had very good compliance with the property owners uh, to go ahead and get the, the lights shielded. And the most recent ones were along the Great Oaks property residential and then the, the uh, Great Oaks apartment buildings along uh, the property boundary. There's two different owners there and both come, complied with our request of shielding the lights. The one to the north, was it the Rochester or something? Apartment? Rochester Place and the other ones I think are Great Oaks. And they both and they both been helpful and compliant? Yes, correct. Okay. So if you were to run into a uh, building owner or manager who does not want to comply, does this allow you to create a hammer for the city to find them or what is the recourse so i guess i need a little bit of help from the city attorney but the way basically the current standard is written there is some requirements for new construction and shielding mr attorney yes and that's and that's where the sunset um provision that i was sort of speaking of so the the it would allow those um, um situations to phase out those offending situations the spending lights uh, over the next year uh, unless they were damaged by more than 50 percent or the light is uh, swapped out so think of it as a non-conforming light at that point like non-conforming uses so um, they would be put on notice that they do have to uh, change that to they don't have to remove the light they have to add shielding of some sort to to comply so it really from what we've understood from the ones who did come client it was not really that big of a deal they took some some metal and the, the it, they fabricated. Yeah. So if you um, if you go back into the Wayback Machine when uh, the shielding was required with the lighting um, was really, I, I, you'd have to help me, um, Mr. Attorney, but probably 10 or years or so ago, but there was no, at that time, um, impetus to go ahead and talk to any of the property owners from the commercial or that standpoint to add the shields. It's been recently that we've now been using that section of the code to go ahead and uh, seek uh, compliance. So if they do not comply with that, you know, after the year, then it would be a violation of the code and we could prosecute it like we would any other code violation. Thank you. Would we be on sound ground? Um, sort of like the swimming pool issue. They're already there. And can we make a law and go back and demand changes from something that's been there for 20 30 years well that that is it it, it, it depends who you draw off in, in the court but yeah. um so something like this i don't think would ever get that far um but to your point it is non-conforming there are some there is some case law that talks about sunsetting of some non-conformities and I, it i'm sure the court would look at it from a reasonableness perspective um that that if you're uh, you know you're not asking to knock down a building you're asking to shield a light and so i, I think we're very uh, i i think so i if i don't think it would ever get there but i think we'd be solid grounding for for such a sunset provision so i'm gonna have a hand up christian um, and to the jeff not to make your life more difficult but with respect to the exemptions in section four there i see a through e What's the likelihood or chance of having letter F with residential lighting included in there? Is that too late or is that ship sailed? Which one, Christian? I'm looking at, it would be page five. And you've got the section B above it. So 3B would have the change that's requested. And then number four below that exemptions, it says the following uses shall be exempt from the provisions of this section. And then you have A through E. And then the, I would wondering if it's possible to have the inclusion of a letter F that says residential lighting, just so it's clearly spelled out. That that's not a difficulty for me at all. I think it's this is the time to okay. for such a change. And that's I would certainly I think for me personally I would asset or if we could <coughs> put it in that's right does do any of these does anything in this ordinance refer to residential though I, the, I, that's i'm not sure if this 
I don't know if it does, but from a perspective of clarification and to remove any doubt, you know, just from a legal perspective, I would say, listen, it, this way it removes any uncertainty that this may have an impact on residential lighting. I would strictly just put in there that it exempts, it specifically exempts residential lighting, just like I think the Rochester Hills one does as well. Mr. Chair, if I may supplement. Uh, so that, that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, in fact, I was flipping through because some of the, like subsection one uh, deals with certain uh, CBD as the other use. Uh, B1, O1, and O2 districts. Um, then subsection two specifically deals with those same uh, plus parking one districts. Three is exterior lighting in all districts. So, and four is an exemption. So, I, I think while I would interpret residential to not be included in that, I don't see any harm with adding a specific um, uh, residential to residential exclusion. Right. Nick, I assume there's no specific uh, residential to residential with respect to all these new single family homes that are built. Is there any lighting requirement there? There, there, if I, I can jump in on that, there, okay. there is still right. the, the one foot candle requirement. That exists. Mm -hmm. right. Yes. So I was going to say that, that's the overriding uh, key. Yeah, and Mr. Chairman, um, that one is easy, not easy, but that one we have some pretty good guidelines that the city attorney has provided with us at the one foot candle right now. Okay. So when we have had uh, complaints, We'll go out um, at, in the evening time and go ahead and measure at the property line according to the current code. If we find that the light uh, source is above the one candela, then we'll write a violation notice to the property owner and we'll give them suggestions like shield it, reduce the wattage, or do something in respect to then bring their light source in compliance at the property line. Do you have many complaints, residential to residential? I would say we maybe handle one or two on an annual basis, and that would be it. <clears throat> that was my recollection. I know there were some folks who were really adamant about this, and then there were other folks who spoke up and said, I don't want my neighborhood darkened. I mean, I want the lights. I want to, I want to feel safe walking around. I want my mom to feel safe. So it's tricky. It's a tricky one for me. Um, with so few complaints, I'm, and, and, uh, Mr. I Chair, would rather see it stay as it is, to be honest with you. That's just my two cents. And I might add that when we have investigated those complaints, uh, we did find in one case it to be over, and the resident did go ahead and make corrections. Okay. So generally, under the current law, you have been lucky or fortunate to get compliance. Yes. And, and because we have that um, a piece of science engaged in that by... It's not an opinion of what I can see. Yeah. It, it's an. Uh, here's it's, what the meter says. A, here's what the meter says, and we have very specific guidelines, and which is then very easy then to explain to the resident of uh, who may complain. We, we measured it, or to the one who may be found out of compliance. Uh, okay. It's easy to show them the science. So, so Jeff, you're looking for our input in terms of whether or not you should take this to the next step and actually write a revised ordinance. So what's before you, there's a couple options you have. One is to, to consider what is already, that we already did, which is to remove the, the bare ball uh, prohibitions and to put the sunset provision in. You can say, yes, we like that, so then you would set it for a public hearing, just like the other one. Um, if you don't want any changes to the ordinance, then you take no action, uh, and it dies at this, at, this, uh, at this level. Or if there's other changes or different changes, you could direct us in that way too. Steve, you were trying to get in here. Yep, thank you. Uh, so probably a question to both the commission and to the city attorney. Under three section, or three, section three, subsection B, so would there be willingness for a provision for um, a complaint-based evidence outside of just non-compliance to initiate uh, an acceleration of the sunset provision? Would we consider that? And secondly, the second question would be, why wouldn't we carve out? We, we've carved out specifically both commercial and municipal. Why can't we carve out same standards for residential to residential? Because I, I, in all respect, Chief, um, 
I think it is a bigger issue than, because I hear more than one or two complaints a year about this. So I think we should at least consider it. What do you think, folks? Does, does the inclusion hmm. of the exclusion F cover that, or it needs to be more defined? I don't, maybe, Mr. Sage, could you clarify, Are you do you want the inclusion of residential in this? Well, we would have to adopt something, wouldn't yeah. we? Right. I mean, that would be a whole separate part of it. Do any of our peer uh, communities that we've uh, surveyed address residential in here in your studies? I know some of them said not residential, doesn't include residential. Uh, well, yes and no. I mean, they do talk about, um, I, I guess I kind of went through and did a search of all their exterior lighting um, requirements, and I kind of highlighted in here hopefully uh, hopefully the highlight comes through but um, where I thought it was close um, somebody there's a a couple um, a couple uh, city council members said oh I like the Rochester Hills ordinance which says uh, you can't have bare bulb showing I'm paraphrasing um, and same with uh, but in the next page it says except that doesn't apply to residential you don't have to model years after Rochester Hills, but they had one in there and they decided to not have it applied to residential lighting. Um, and the other one they pointed to was uh, Northville, uh, which is, um, I think it applies to just commercial, but it says all uh, external lights uh, shall be shielded or otherwise positioned so that the source of light does not adversely affect the driver or pedestrian uh, visibility and negatively or negatively affect adjacent properties so some city council members um, express the well i think that would be okay to put in um, to apply um, but there is also uh, to your point there is a do we have three different types of regulations do we have commercial then do we have city lights you know city streets and city and then uh, residential and so that's really kind of where we are is right now those the shielding requirement is uh, that we're proposing or that's in there uh, deals with commercial and multiple family but if if uh, for instance mr sage uh, indicated well that should be applicable residential to residential then we wouldn't exempt residential from that in fact we would specifically include it so uh, i think uh, commissioner hauser's suggestion of removing it is the opposite of Mr. Sage's. We want to make it does apply to residential. Residential. <clears throat> I think that's where. Um, I think that's where we stand on that issue. Steve, just to uh, bring you up to where we started this. I don't know, eight, ten, twelve months ago, and the chief had a lot of pretty serious complaints, and we said at the time that uh, we asked them to make it a project to go around and seek cooperation. And we told them, basically, if you don't get cooperation, please come back to us, and we will do it by ordinance. You know, we'll make you do it. And that's why I'm spending so, so much time asking the chief, how, how have you done? And he says, we've done really well. In fact, nobody has failed, neither residential or commercial. So that's why you catch me saying, and why can't we just continue this on instead of raising? Okay, so I'll, I'll separate my comments. To the first one, could we add the provision of, on the sunset, on the commercial and multifamily uh, properties, could we also add the addition of complaint-based compliance, right? If, if a complaint comes forward, because otherwise, that you can complain, but unless the, the uh, non-conforming light is damaged, the So I would see those myself as minor and probably would support those changes. Okay. So, Christian, Mr. But Chairperson, if there's a com if it's if it's a complaint, it would go to the chief, and the chief would enforce it based on the language of. That's exactly what I was going to say. You would see complaint. compliance, but then, yeah. well, I, regardless of the sunset clause, if there was a complaint, we would move forward as we have already done, yeah. and ask for compliance. And if we don't get compliance, then we would be taking the next step of uh, citation. 
Yeah, right. and you can do that now. We can do that right now, and we do do that right now. Yeah. The complaint would act as an accelerant to the sunset without having that language in there. Yeah. Right. David. If I can clarify, and then I was asked a question. The complaint is to verify if it's one candela or more at a property line between residential. <laughs> it's not whether it's a, an exposed <coughs> light source, right? You're not judging whether a light source is there visible, you're looking at the measurement of a candela. That's what you do on a, on a complaint. We, because of the way the current is set up, we, we look a little bit at both of them. But the science of the matter is, is when we measure the one candela. There, there is no current sunset provision in the ordinance. So that, that's, that's proposed language. So there is, and, and that wouldn't have anything to do with the bare bulb or anything. That's, that's just the, the added requirement that that language adds, which is that uh, shielding downward so the light doesn't shine into a residential windowed side of a house. So those, those are two are kind of in lockstep uh, in that section. Um, but that currently wouldn't apply to residential to residential. And that's really the point. I was, I was going to follow up to Councilman Sage's concern is that the added regulation or ordinance item to say we can't have an exposed light source or a bare bulb is not something I could support. And, and the reason is the, the character of the downtown housing mostly is what I'm really thinking of is made up of that sort of Sorry, thing. David, your mic, please. Thank you, Sienna. <laughs> Thank you. When I look at the downtown in general, it, it has a, 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 a characteristics of an era, and part of that era is a bare bulb or a light source that's visible. Um, and I don't think we can change that. I don't think we should change that. We could, but I don't think we should. And if that's kind of what you're thinking we should do, I would not be too supportive of that i'm all for protecting you know light um, spilling over into a neighbor's yard or house and i think that's what you do now if you look at it it's one candela you need to do something about it but if i could see a light bulb and it's not more than one candela it's just a light source it's not a an item that <clears throat> we should regulate i, I think um, at what point do you say that you can't have any lights and I don't think that that's a good thing for us to think about or do. And which is why I asked again or suggested I agree with you. Commercial, multifamily, it ought to be some type of containment. But the residential to residential, I think, creates a, a conversation that probably is beyond what's presented to us today, which is why I said let's exclude that and let's exempt it so we don't have that confusion because there already is an ordinance on the book that the chief can address if there is a complaint. And, and I hate to see a new ordinance used to sort of beat people over the head right. because some people believe more deeply in this than maybe the general population does. Right. Now, there's there's going to be some disagreement or complaint about anything we do. Yeah. At what, at what point do we allow something that's appropriate, practical, and safe to continue? And we have the backup of the administration saying that just about every time they've had a complaint, they've gotten compliance. <clears throat> what does the sunset provision do? Just explain it in. Sure. So the sunset provision um, allows for, so say there's a, Apartment light that's shining. Let's use the real example. Um, the I'm sorry, Jeff. Kate. Ah, I, I did a sage. I'm sorry, I did a gas. I'm sorry. Um, so, so the the sunset provision merely says. So let's say they, they using a real example of the Great Oaks apartments. They complied, but let's say they said, you know what, we don't want to, we don't want to do that. This would actually say you have to do this within a year. Okay. We, we've notified you that this is a problem. You have to have the shielding directed downward, not facing a uh, house light or house window. So they would have a year to come into compliance or it would be in violation of the code. So a sunset is essentially, it sunset gets rid of the non-conforming situation. Okay, but gives them time. It, it gives them a year, yeah. But that's not 
proposed to be included in the residential basis here. Correct. Uh, the these that that was only for commercial and multiple family, not residential. Okay. Okay. Yes. Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, t to me, they, a, a year to fix that seems really long. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, is, it seemed like it could get a month to fix it or three months or <laughs> something. So a year seems long. You know, we've been kicking this around for a while. I mean, you know, you say people will do the right thing, and I think they will in, until they don't. Yeah. Right? So we have to give the chief and the, the city attorney, as, you, as Mr. Stone said, some hammer to be able to, to enforce that. But you that. have that hammer now. I mean, you write a right. ticket. If it doesn't get resolved, you'll go to court, I assume. Correct. And Correct. We so far have not had to write a citation or go to the court. So we don't know how the courts would react to it, right. but but it exists. Right. So you know, so if Mr. Sage has some some language that helps that, um, you know, I, I I could support that just as though they have the tools they need, because you know I I live in the part of town where, you know, the houses are close, so I I don't have that problem, but I I feel for that problem. So yeah. I just want to make sure that, you know, whatever ordinance we do clearly gives them all the support they need. Would this add teeth to I'm the... I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. I was just going to add, you know, just sitting here thinking for a minute, if you were to take an a overhead look at the city, the largest area of noncompliance has been corrected, and that's really along the great oaks. When we start taking a look at the rest of the city, the interface of multifamily apartments and or dwellings is much smaller than what it was along that Great Oaks boundary, okay. if I could add that. Would this proposed change give your ordinance more teeth? Well, I, I would say yes because the city attorney put it in there, but I would also say that we, we are also um, handling it uh, on a basis by basis and getting that compliance with that also. So with the sunset clause, we would not look at not taking action you know, we would take a, a complaint action right away, regardless of the sunset clause. Okay. Nick, I, I have a question for you. Are you still there, Nick? Well, here's... Uh, yep, I'm still here. Yep, go ahead. Uh, I see on the agenda that next meeting we're probably going to be handling the issue of uh, 200 and some carports put around the Forest Ridge apartments and I can't yep. believe that they're going to put them in in the dark so how would this impact that project well I have to shield them from the residential side which is not a problem and you have sufficient authority to do that now yep okay I went and looked at the carports out by, for the name of the development, by the OPC to, to check Cedar them out. Brook. And oh, Cedar Brook, yeah. Yeah, Cedar Brook. So what they've done is they've added, I think they have the tall, you know, lighting throughout the parking lot, but then they've added lighting underneath the carports yeah. that just illuminates the carports itself, which is, I, I think, what they would have to do to keep that well lit. Yeah, that's and it doesn't, Jeremy, that's actually the carports they're trying to emulate. Yeah, and it doesn't seem like that would be, you know, spilling onto neighboring properties or anything like that. Okay. Okay, folks, what do you think? <clears throat> we have all this work that's been done for us here. Mm -hmm. So we are proposing to push this to a public hearing? Um, Is that where this next didn't we First, we need an hearing? ordinance to re review, a final ordinance. And Jeff is asking, what do you want in it, if anything? Any change from what you got now? Mr. Chairman, I would, my opinion is adding that item F um, would clarify some ambiguity, possibly, and I'm all for it. Maybe. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Point out item F again. What page is that on? It, it, it's a new uh, uh, item um, added would be to residential to residential to be exempt. It would be under exemptions under number four. There's already letters A through E, and we would I would ask for the inclusion of a letter F that just says residential lighting, and it would be 
exactly the same type that would be found in the exempt lighting in the city of Rochester Hills in that same section. Steve, does that help your? Well, uh, two two follow-ups to that, and I guess I'll work with you on the other section then that would directly address residential to residential, and that'll have to come before council and bring it back to the planning commission. Okay, so with the exemption of residential res residential under section two three zero six. Again, I guess ask, I'd ask the chief because, yes, the way the ordinance has been proposed to be revised right now, it solves our problem based on uh, your diligence uh, through the department. I'm just thinking of the future. Do we need to have some provision in here so it just never happens again to where we don't have to ask the next chief, hey, can we just do this, right? So is it something prudent to do now to where if we keep this sunset in there, well, I guess there will be a point where it, doesn't matter but at the same time does it help us and help you to say if there is a complaint base that we can accelerate this I think the, the point that you can help us the most on is to make sure that the ordinance however you end up with it um, is based on some sort of science one candela two candela 20 half a can whatever the candela is that way we can have something that we can go out and quantitatively identify <coughs> as it's in compliance or not in compliance. If we, if we, if we can um, stay around that from a compliance standpoint, and then from the, the uh, commercial multifamily, um, if we can coalesce around the shielding of the light, um, and I think that we have something that we can effectively interpret and enforce uh, within the city okay so from from the commercial and multi-family uh, resident uh, uh, buildings that I think that ordinance addresses this um, okay so I, I think that the further discussion will be on the residential but you feel comfortable you can enforce this here but you don't need any more to help you with that year Sunday no I think uh, from working with the city attorney and Unless you, unless I've missed something, uh, Attorney Crowd, but I think we're pretty good with the commercial and the multifamily um, as it's written. So, when you refer to complaint-based, like say there's complaint, which was clearly the City Council's um, um, preference Correct. to accelerate, um, I would say that the only way to do that would to accelerate. The, the sunset because otherwise w if there's no requirement for downward shielding well let me, let me step back so if the, if, the, if the downward shielding requirement that we're saying to put in if a, if a property was in violation or wouldn't comply with that that would they would have a year to do that so or to to put the shielding on or get a new so the chief would say hey, just to let you know, that's a violation of the code, let's fix it. And if they didn't fix it over the next year, they would have to. Uh, but maybe you put in there, uh, I wouldn't want to go less than six months, just because it's, so maybe if it's complaint-based, we, we advance that to six months. Is that? Okay, so maybe I'll amend my suggestion to, to this commission. Um, is a year, would six months be enough? Could we... Would it still exempt residential? Well, that's going to be a separate issue because obviously that's that's not being addressed here. And a six-month issue with residential is pretty long. Well, no, I'm think? not worried about residential yet. This strictly only applies to commercial and multifamily. How about six months? This has nothing to do with resident. I don't see anything in here to, to Commissioner King's uh, point. This really does not address residential, residential. to residential. So no, the issue, six yeah, months? the issue raised was on the commercial side, and when we had our initial public hearing, there was, I think, maybe one person that called in about the residential, but the main focus was commercial, and we said they're very different issues in the way that the lights are and everything, and we need to tackle them separately because then it came into, well, what about string lights if we say bare bulb? And it was like all these scenarios came up, right? So we were tackling you know, kind of them separate, and there really hasn't been a push on the residential side from... A council member or from the public so this was what was addressed first my my opinion I'm fine with six months we need to keep this as simple as possible I think if you had a complaint base that accelerates the sun setting 
it's hard for the city to track. It's harder for, it's just why, why overcomplicate things? If one year's too long, then let's just change it to six months. I think we should add in the residential to residential exclusion because I don't think that we want to, we're not talking about, you know, adding, adding. Yeah, we don't want this. Shields to those. You know, it, it's a different issue to address. That's what worries me. Somebody hangs up these beautiful lights you see everywhere, and the next door neighbor, for whatever reason, files a complaint. It's a bare ball, you know. It's right. a bare ball. Absolutely. It's an bulb, so Absolutely. There you go. Yeah. Okay. I have no problem with six months. Yeah. So that would be the the change we'd suggest. That that would be that would be fine. I would um, on the other change the the four F. I think that we do actually want to make that, uh, as I'm looking at this, we might want to put that up in that section B. Um, and the reason I say that is because the um, subsection 3 actually does apply to residential, which is exterior lighting of all districts. That's the one-foot candle limitation. So okay. we, don't, we, we want to keep the one-foot candle limitation mm -hmm. for residential as well. Right. We don't want to negatively affect that. So I with with... With the uh, commission's permission, I would the not for residential uh, exemption. I'm going to go ahead and put that up by the shielding requirement. It's specifically. Can you tell me where specifically where are you putting that? Yes. It would be three B. Three B. Four. Correct. Correct. So okay. would we would we change then the exterior lighting in all districts? So how would people interpret that? We, all, what, are, what does all districts mean? All, all di the only thing that the all districts does is the one foot candle. That's that's the only provision. So you have the one foot candle is in three A. Okay. So three B refers to just that shielding requirement, commercial and multiple family. Regardless of what district they're in. So the one but, foot candle in A applies to residential. Correct. But then B, even though it says commercial and multifamily, we're also going to say it does not apply to residential. Correct. For clarification, correct. So, if I may, Mr. Wait. Chairman, item 3A essentially says what we want it to say. Right. But the point that uh, Mr. Howard was making was make a real simple point and say residential is an exclusion. Maybe 4BF wasn't maybe the best place to put it. The point was just to make it absolutely clear. There's no confusion. Yeah, and I, and I think 3A says it, but not so straightforward. 3A deals with the one-foot candle period. The okay. B refers to a requirement of shielding regardless of foot candles. Right. Okay. So you're saying I, to, I get your point there. Yeah. So you're saying to add that to residential, they would un be under the same? No. 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 Exempting that. That's the part we would exempt residential from was is that shielding requirement yeah. in B. Right. Yeah, I, I Mr. Chairman, that. if you remember the complaint along with the commercial to the residential was we did do our measurements and it was under one foot candle, yes. but there was yes. still an issue with the residents about why can, you know, the light still seems it, to be. It was an annoyance. To it was person. an annoyance. And so that's why uh, <clears throat> even though it, it was under the one candela, we enforced then the shielded part of the ordinance. And got, com and got compliance. Got compliance. Okay. Christian? Yeah. Mr. City Attorney, I don't. You know, I'll leave the drafting to you and the and the, the scrivener. But I I don't know if you even just say something to the extent that Section Three B shall not apply to residential lighting. Something, sure. Yeah. I'll, I, I'll, I'll work through no, that. No, I, I understand. So, okay, so let's look ahead. So if we draft a separate ordinance to address residential, which is going to circumvent then this ordinance. Well, it this addresses residential in Three A. To the extent that we feel. To the extent of one candela. That, yeah. But that's it. That's where we that's where we draw the line, right? That's what you say, one candela. So we can go and measure that, right? It measures one candela. But yet, if it's one candela and still impedes my property line, it's still okay. It's only one candela, right? 
I, I would challenge that most residents don't know what one candela is. I'm, I'm in the construction Understood. business. Uh, Understood. And, and I'll tell but you right if you're now, the resident to where the ho where the light comes into the house, yeah. wh what do you tell them? Is you don't know what one candela is? But you I got mean, compliance most, from the one case we're talking about. Yeah. Even though it was under one candela. It, they were actually over one candela, and so we got them to reduce the light. So they did. Right. Yes. Mr. Chair, it, I think uh, Council Member uh, Sage's question is exactly the input we're looking for tonight, which is if you wanted something to deal residential to residential, let us know what you would like that to say. We're happy to put that language in there. This, I think this would be the time to craft something. So if there's, if you had an idea, we, you know, we, we'd be happy to, to put it into words for you on how you'd want that. I'm I, like, I'm of the opinion, we have something today. I don't really know what one candela is and if that is bothersome or not for people. Um, but I'm really hesitant to be too restrictive here and over governing what, you know, people do from a residential standpoint. Um, I'm of the opinion that you should address it with your neighbors. And I, I had a neighbor, our landscape light got turned and they said it was bothering them. It was in their window. I didn't even know. We moved it. You know, it's it's little things. If hope. you can, what we happened? can dim our lights. You can put in lower Dimmers. watt bulbs. Yeah. I mean, it should be easy solutions. I don't want to over govern. I, I would agree. I would completely agree with that. I, I don't know, like, what can you do besides measuring the light? Because we've already talked that nobody wants to shield or say no bare bulbs because of the architectural look that fits with the city. I, I guess if there's other suggestions, I'm open to them, but I'm very cautious. I would agree with Commissioner King and Commissioner Stone. I don't think this, I, I wouldn't be in favor of messing <coughs> with the residential. And that's kind of where we came right. to eight months ago, <coughs> which was right. the big problem. Clearly the big problem was the apartment complex. Right. It's been addressed. And we solved it. It's so, solved. Yes. And we've had very few residential complaints. I, I know you're getting more. I know you're getting more. Commissioner, In my humble you? opinion, we should put change this, the uh, sunset to six months, That's leave fine. it alone, and be open to as we were the last time. If things come up, we'll address them at a later time. I, I, personally, I think the issue with the lighting goes back to uh, changes in code from years ago or, or zoning ordinances that allowed a lot of these monster houses to go in on small lots yeah. and you know if someone's got their bedroom light on and the shade and the shades or drapes are wide open it's probably producing more than one candle into the neighboring house since yeah. it's only three to five feet off the lot line mm -hmm. and so we can try to regulate it and stop it, but who's going to be the one to walk up to the door and say, shut your bedroom light off, it's going into your neighbor's home? Just remember, this is exterior lighting, not interior lighting. Right, but some people but are not going to know exterior. the difference. They're going to get mad because it's just bright. Yeah. Right? And so where are we at? Creating a lot of confusion. Mr. Chairman, I agree with the last three comments as well as the six months. And so so um, should we set a public hearing or... You'll would, produce a final draft for I, I would set up for, I, I think you, you may be right. I was trying to think if we had one, but. I think if, uh, since we're going to tweak it and spend so long, so I, I think this one is probably worth setting the public hearing. And if at that point, you're, it's your chance to look at the new version anyway before it goes to city council. So would you be ready second meeting in, in October or first in December? In November, that's probably... No, I, I could set at the same time as we just did the fence one. These aren't big changes. Okay, very good. Do you want a motion? Please. Can I make a motion to set this for a public hearing with two changes? Um, the one year going to six months and then adding under 3B a 4 that specifically stating that it excludes residential to residential. For sure. Is there support? Support. support. So moved by uh, Ms. King, supported by Christian Hauser. Uh, any other discussion? The roll call, please. Chairman McGee? Yes. Mayor Bixen? Yes. Council Member Sage? No. Members Gasson? Yes. Hauser? Yes. King? Yes. And Stone? Yes. Thank you. 
I just comment to all of Hello. you commissioners. Um, I'm impressed with how you dig into these things and really understand them and uh, provokes great discussion. I think it's fine. So just my two cents. All right. Uh, Hello. Dennis. Yes. A comment. Oh, okay. Uh, a, li ahead. a live one. Yeah, 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 someone's on the phone. Okay, call her. This is Hello, a, hopefully I'm still alive. Say that again. I said hopefully I'm still alive. Oh, good. Who is calling, I've please? I've been trying to call in during sure. your discussion. Who's calling, please? The phone number on the thing that I printed out this morning off of your... Uh, Website? Video, virtual public meeting... The phone number is wrong. Uh, okay, we'll uh, work on that. But who are you? What is your name, please? Oh, I'm sorry. This is Jane Turner, longtime resident, 712 Parkdale. Hi, Jane. Welcome to our meeting. The floor is yours. Okay. I strongly suggest you do the house to house illumination. I've had a neighbor, two neighbors ago, that had his floodlight on, can and I, it shined into my bedroom window. Can I interrupt real quick? Don't we have public comment? We've just set this for public comment. Um, well, that would be good if we had the right wait, phone number. I would say since she had difficulty getting in, let's, let's hear. No, I'm just saying we've set this item for public comment, though. Shouldn't we address public comment on this at the public hearing? So that way other people have the benefit of it. We can do that, but this woman tried to get in during our discussion, and so I'm, I'm going to let her speak. Okay. Thanks. Go ahead. So I really strongly suggest you have the house-to-house -house illumination because I've had that problem before, and I have a question for Nick. Was Village Green addressed in that? Have they corrected their problem? Hello, is Nick still there? Chief, do we have a problem at Village Green? No complaints have been reserved. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I would like uh, to voice my complaint. This, uh, the caller, Nick, has, uh, is asking about Village Green and whether or not they have uh, corrected their problems. The chief says you have not. I know they had problems. First, I heard of it. And the chief concurs with that. Jane, go ahead. Okay. There is an illumination that comes from their western side of the family, of the apartments, through the water tower property, through my kitchen window, through the dining room and into my bedroom, and it's very annoying. Nick and the so chief, would you, would you meet with her? Oh, we'll, we don't need to meet with, we'll meet with the Well, this is the same scenario, uh, Great Oaks Oak Chief. Yes. Yeah, we, this, this is exactly what you're trying to address with your ordinance, where it says it has to be shielded within six months. So it's a, if that's a complaint, then we would follow up on it. Jane, there. Okay, now, this only happens after the leaves fall and before they spring out in the spring. Makes sense. Yep. I can work with the chief on this. You got it. Jane will okay. uh, we'll have action immediately. Okay, thank you very much. Can you put me on mute? Um, I can't, but uh, we can. Maybe Sienna can. Yeah. Is that all you had yeah, at this I point? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Thanks for calling. All right. I'm going to move now to 4D, consideration or review of the master plan draft and recommendation to city council. Uh, do we have Michelle? Yes. The, there we go. Good evening, everyone. Aren't these meetings interesting that you get to they sit? Are. Yeah. They are. Okay. If I understood correctly, Sienna is going to be able to share my presentation, and it should be on both screens. So that with that, Sienna, go ahead and uh, go ahead and put them up. There we go. Great. 
so if you all remember, um, I called in at the September 7th meeting, I believe, um, where we initiated our conversation about um, the master plan and the adoption process, and you had requested some materials that showed what exactly was changed from the last master plan. So in your packet, there should be a memo with some bullet points for each section, what was updated, and there's also a draft that has highlighted what has been changed, and I'm going to go over some of the details right now. So, Siana, thank you. So just in case there's anyone new here to the Planning Commission or what master planning is, this is a long-term comprehensive policy document. So you can see there in the fourth bullet point, it covers a wide range of topics, all the different elements that make up a city. So natural features, housing, commercial industrial land uses, all of that is covered in here. Um, and Rochester has done a really good job of staying up to date. So the last one was written in 2014. Um, maybe even possibly with Vidya, if she's still on the line. Um, and that it has been reviewed every five years and that's why we are updating it now. So it's not an entire overhaul. You can tell by the bullet points. We just updated certain sections of it. Um, but by and large, it's pretty similar to before. Siana, I'll go to the next slide. Thank you. So this is even kind of a summary of a summary. There's in your memo, you can see what, um, what's been changed. But the major points here are, um, well, we'll start with the first one here. Special projects was, um, is recommended to be removed. And that's because we did a very thorough um, review of the future land use map and we made sure that the kinds of changes that we wanted to see were incorporated there and that those would serve as a basis for um, zoning ordinance updates. In addition, we added a sustainability section and that was really um, kind of sparked from the sustainability framework that um, you all came up with and worked on and so we incorporated a lot of that information into the master plan because the master plan has the most statutory weight behind it so it's really the basis for any kind of policy that we want to form. Um, we also did an update to parking. We had a sub consultant on our team who evaluated your parking and there's some findings in the master plan about that. We talked um, quite a bit more about housing and their we included tiny homes into the back of the plan where there are different housing types that are available. We included that as one. Um, as you know, during this process, the 2020 census came out, so we made sure to use that. It's the most up-to-date data that we have. Um, as all master plans have, we looked through the zoning ordinance, talked with staff. So there's some zoning ordinance amendments. Um, I should say recommendments for amendments. Um, and then we looked at all the tools at the back of the master plan. There's a long list of tools that are at your disposal to get where you want to go to achieve your goals. So we looked at those and, and added a couple there. Okay, so just so you understand the process of this plan, um, myself and my team, we started the research. We wrote most of the updates, and what we did with that was bring it to staff, city staff. We also had four subcommittees. You can see there are housing, sustainability, parking, and downtown connections. So we held meetings with them, ran and passed our ideas and thoughts with them. Um, I also went to the DDA and shared anything that would be related to the DDA with them. And sat down with staff again, reviewed all of it, and now it's with the Planning Commission as you guys are enabled by the state to be the authors, enforcers, and guardians of the master plan. So you guys at this point, uh, which is on the last slide, are really kind of get to kick off the adoption process, which is mandated by the state. So I'll get into that later. Just so you have a recap on what we did for community engagement, um, every, I believe it's three years, the city mails out surveys. Um, asking um, resident satisfaction on, a, on an array, uh, array of different topics. So we included those into the master plan where they were relevant. 
Like I mentioned with those subcommittees, we held um, several meetings with them to go over the content and with staff. And then we held two in-person and one virtual engagement session um, to hear from the public at large. So I'm just going to briefly go through some of the findings for where ma the major um, changes were done. We looked at housing affordability. Um, because unlike a lot of communities in Rochester, um, you don't have a problem with you know high demand and a lot of development coming your way. That's already apparent. What's um, more of an issue is building housing that can be um, attainable at all income levels or stages of life. So when we look at affordable housing, you can see from those graphs that there are some challenges there for owners and renters. And when we look at housing preferences, because that's one way to tie in um, different price points for housing is having different housing types, we can see that Rochester actually does have quite um, a nice range of housing and that we would really need to keep that up in order to accommodate growth. Next slide. So this is one <coughs> example. We did this with three different sites, but I just wanted to show um, at one of our community engagement sessions, we presented the public with different sites that were selected by my team and staff. Um, we gave them a history of the site, we gave them all the zoning constraints, and then we asked them what they wanted to see there. Um, and so this example, which is not too far from Main Street, we were able to... Um, from the public's recommendations kind of sketch up what it could look like so that we would have an idea of how many units, how they would be oriented, how they would be um, related to the river and to bike paths. So I believe the next slide shares that. Right. So um, we also crunched the numbers. We know that people's biggest complaints with housing is traffic. So we looked at how many dwelling units there would be, how many trips there would be, and this is based on um, engineers, you know, best practices and, and their experience with that. So we created that table and then just a quick rendering to show what it could look like. Okay, in terms of sustainability, we use a lot, um, if not all, of the indicators that were in the sustainable framework, which I heard you all addressing today in one of your developments, so I'm happy to see that that's in use. We really just took a lot of those ideas and updated them. That was written, uh, I think, in 2018, but had to use 2016 data. So we looked at a lot of those numbers, and we talked about impervious surfaces, open space, how to protect our natural features, our watershed. And then we added in their renewable energy, since that is um, emerging as you know, a, a type of renewable energy that, or solar in particular, is, is emerging as a renewable energy that's becoming more affordable to use. Um, with Downtown Connections, we created this map here. You can see that there's three different um, corridors that are selected, and the, the first one, Payne Creek to Clinton River, is what we were determining as bike focus. So that is where we would, or the city would, um, really invest in the top of the line type of infrastructure and public safety for bicyclists. Um, and that was, those were selected because of um, them being slightly off the main drag, that there'd be less potential conflict with vehicles, um, that the topography is a little bit more favorable, um, and that there's a bit more room. So if we kind of go down that scale, then we have bike friendly, where we'd also want to see bike improvements, and those were in the alleyways, so behind um, the commercial core of the downtown. And then Main Street, um, based on some traffic studies that have already been done, is, is primed to stay primarily pedestrian focused, as there's not quite the room um, to be building bike lanes in that environment. So that's one update as well as that map, as well as the discussion of, of that kind of hierarchy. This is the parking study that was done by our sub consultant and you can see here that um, you know a, a large majority of residents feel that parking is good or excellent. 
Um, and we can see that by the fact that complaints have decreased, um, but that revenues are still falling short of expenditures. Um, and so that's something that the city will, will have to tackle um, in the next you know, few years. So those are the major updates. I want to talk about the process. Um, <laughs> that um, should be on the first one. So this is the the city council one. But the the first box there, planning commission recommends for distribution. So if you all feel comfortable tonight, the, the intention is really that you would, um, by motion, recommend to council that they approve this for distribution. So this is what we were talking about last time. Council has that right, um, and when they approve it, then it's going, then the master plan would go into a 63-day review period. So it's going to be posted online. We're going to mail out letters to the state mandates that we send them out to so that your neighboring communities can review it and send in comments. So they have a little over two months to do so. Then at the end of that, there would be a public hearing, so the public would be invited. We would share all of the comments that we've collected. We could still make amendments then. We can make amendments throughout the entire two months up until the, the public hearing. The public hearing would be with the Planning Commission. And then if you guys uh, recommend to council, then they would do the final adoption. So you can see there that at this point, that's still not scheduled until January or February of 2022. So it's a long adoption process that the state makes us go through, but it's so that we can be transparent and give the public an opportunity if they haven't already engaged to get involved. So with that, I know there were some thoughts thrown around last time, but if you've had more time to look at it, um, I'm happy to take notes about any content changes or questions that you have about the master plan or the process. Just uh, kind of preface before the, uh, the commissioners speak. <clears throat> I think we all take our duty here very seriously. Mm -hmm. And I think the, uh, the council will be looking for us to uh, address that duty fully. Um, I think we're, we're troubled by the schedule. We, okay. This group, you, you saw us in action tonight. There are a lot of very deep thinking, mm -hmm. highly experienced folks here. I think we need more time. Uh, I know that does not meet with perhaps the administration's schedule, but um, there are some changes that some of us perceive as significant, and we're not probably comfortable with them. So with that in mind, I, I want to throw it open to the commissioners, but I don't want you to leap ahead and think that this is going to be a slam dunk because it's probably not going to be. Okay. Christian. Sure. sure. Um, thanks for coming again. Sure. You know, the first thing that caught my eye was on your slide, page number two, the summary of changes in item number one. It says this master plan update recommends special projects be removed in the future land use map. So what is the basis and what is the mm -hmm. reasoning like that you would remove special projects mm -hmm. in the next master plan? I mean, I stopped. No, I didn't stop reading the whole thing after that. <laughs> Please, I, I was, but it's a big hurdle. But that's—I mean—that's to me that was like neon lights. What's? Why is that? Sure. So, um, and again, so I don't have personal experience with that. Probably video would more someone who's doing the actual zoning and site planning. But from what's been relayed to me is that um, that there wasn't agreement necessarily among. Planning Commission and Council, and that it wasn't necessarily yielding the results that you all were looking for. I may want to have Blaine or Nick or Sienna speak more. But before you do that, can I ask you who told you that there wasn't consistency or that there wasn't the results? That who was okay. the person who gave you that information? So I have to be honest, my predecessor started and worked primarily on this project. She and that's has since fair. left and your that, company, you got, and I have inherited here. this about a month ago. I'm not picking on you. No, so I don't. I can't actually point to somebody and tell Blaine, you. Blaine, can you help us with that? That's a big hurdle for this body. It's, that's a big tool of ours. And Sure. So, again, just for, for the record, Blaine Wing, city manager. Um, 
So when I first got here this uh, back in November of 2015, special projects is definitely a tool, but it is challenging because there are certain, we can't really guide a developer in a, there's no longer like a bucket that we're allowed to say like, oh, these are the projects or here's the dollar amounts and all those things. So um, having a, a tool like this is, is definitely um, uh, just that, a tool. However, there could be uh, some inconsistencies depending on one developer might be very generous and another one might, might suggest maybe a, a lower number uh, for a project that might be 10,000 another one might offer something that's 500,000. Um, and we can't really give them guidance. Um, looking at how you kind of eliminate that gray area is actually setting the zoning um, and so there's not special projects. How um, if there would be a developer that wants to have a change, we would then need to go through a, a rezoning for that particular uh, area. So there's still a tool or a method to get there. It's just not a uh, kind of a, an easy option to say, well, we're going to ask for six stories here where it's actually zone three. Um, you know, really the, uh, the way to get that inconsistency out is to to have everything zoned what both the Planning Commission and City Council feel is the appropriate heights and depths and you know setbacks and all of those other regulations. <clears throat> so if I could say then just generally the, the kind of trade-off that you're making is you know you can allow for a lot of flexibility and then you can you know it's hard to be credible when there's a lot of discretion given differently Whereas if you, you could also be more rigid with a zoning ordinance and then, you know, the shortcomings with that as well. It's just a trade-off between this is what we're all sticking to, this is what it says right here, versus allowing a lot more flexibility that doesn't allow for the most predictable outcome. And really in zoning and planning and development, what we want from our zoning ordinance is that we know exactly what is going to be produced there. It's predictable, it's streamlined, for everyone involved. David? Did you want to follow up? I, I have a different question, but go ahead. Um, I didn't want to monopolize the... I, I totally get what I think the, the concept is there to develop consistency and some amount of certainty of what you're going to get. Again, back to the idea that this is a tool and um, how you apply that tool comes differently from whoever it is, is going to be making the suggestion and how the tool gets used is kind of up to us. Mm -hmm. uh, and the developer. I want to point out two things as examples that, and there are many more, but I'll just two that stands out in my mind. Uh, on Walnut Street, there was a project, and the use by right would have been a two story building on stilts with parking underneath it. And through the course of special project brainstorming, collaboration with the commission, it was a sensible outcome, mm -hmm. a really good outcome. It wasn't without headaches, but the end result is much better than a two-story building on stilts with parking underneath it. Uh, further back in time than that, we had the Royal Park Hotel. Amazing building that would have never come to Rochester, in my opinion, had we not had the ability to work with a, a willing developer to do something extraordinary, where there really was no spot in Rochester to do something of that magnitude. Um, and based on those two, and there's several others too, but that tool to us, or to me particularly, is invaluable to how we attract um, five-star developers in this town. And I would really not like to see that go away. I think there's restrictions, there's consistency, there's other things you can apply to that, but I think that flexibility is going to attract the kind of people that the city has been attracting for a number of decades now. And I'd hate to lose that. Christian, you had another follow-up. Yeah, and you know, just going down number three, it says tiny homes are included as a housing option. And I've gone through the large set of documents, and I see a tiny, but where, you know, and again, I understand, I'm not trying to pick it, but where mm -hmm. do you see these tiny homes being constructed? Is there yeah. a particular area in town? Is it mm -hmm. a teardown, and then you're going to have a little dollhouse on a yard? I'm just trying to understand. So they would be multifamily. Okay. Um, because... Right, we don't want um, in a single family neighborhood, not that this would likely happen, but theoretically somebody could bulldoze a beautiful big home and put a tiny home and it wouldn't fit the character, the scale of any 
anything in that neighborhood. So it would be restricted to, to multifamily. Um, and that way you could have somewhat like a bungalow court where there could be, you know, a row of five with a courtyard, a row of five on the other side. Um, it's but, just another multifamily option. But when someone asks me, yeah. hey, I went through the master plan, I see they're changing it, and I see that there's tiny houses that they want to build, where are they going to build those? Do you have an answer for that? I don't have a parcel number. I just no, have I'm not the saying, general, I mean, just, like, in yeah. the multifamily areas. Mr. Wing, do you know? It, it, so just uh, one of the projects that actually came before the Planning Commission was the Solaronics uh, yeah. property. Right. And again, without having a special project <laughs> option, um, that would be an area uh, that through our current future uh, land use, um, that that would be a location <coughs> that sure. this would then be eligible. So that could be a site that a tiny home uh, development basically could, could go. Okay. Thank you. I don't have any further questions. Steve, I saw you not even when this came up. You've been you've been around a long time. Uh, well, well, Commissioner Hauser uh, mentioned the first thing that I was going to ask about is a special project because it does add a, a degree of flexibility that we've enjoyed. Uh, and the neat thing about that as well is it still has two filters. It has a check and balance, right? It has to be approved by this commission yep. and by council. Right, so it's not like we're running amok. Well, there um, aren't any examples out there that I believe can be cited that show that we ran. I, I agree, and and I also wanted to cite because um, one of the things in the first few pages, the master plan is not a binding agreement, but rather a planning framework, and I like that. Right, so there are things in here that I may not agree with, um, that I might want to have more time to discuss both within this body and within council and openly with the public. Um, so, uh, City Manager Wing, this timeline we're on, is it artificial or is it charter-based? Is it state-based? Um, so there are, I guess, a little bit of all of those. So um, we are required by the state every five years to go through this. Okay. Um, the next step, when, it, when eventually this would go to City Council, there's a 63-day uh, window that's set there. Um, so but that's not triggered by us. Yes. It, it technically, when you forward it to the, that, that's right. the, the that's the code. We don't have a duty to forward it yet. Th there's not a, uh, I guess, something that compels you yeah. to do it today, two weeks from right. now, a month from now. Um, we are already, a, you know, a little over a year into our four year, five years. <laughs> so uh, we're a little less than than four. Um, the first one actually we. When I was here, we actually didn't get through the full five years, and that's why there's a few more things that are being updated. So, Does the next five start on the date that the new plan is approved? Okay. Yes. Okay. So we're currently living with, some, like, our, our zoning is actually going all the way back to, Nick can probably tell you, I want to say it's like 08. So we have a map that's fairly old now we have a master plan that's from 2014 an and here we are in 2021 almost 2022 um, I'd like to get this just so that when we have developers call call up we have some conflicts and it's hard for them because they're even seeing well you got a, a, a zoning map and then you have your master plan <laughs> you know the ideal component would be to get our master plan updated and then updating our zoning and then you know have all of our documents uh, up to date but a bit more time on our part isn't going to. Nope, uh, it, it's not. Uh, I would encourage you know th this board really to you know why we even have our planner if it's you know tonight or another night to maybe even set aside to go through any of the topics. Um, the, the mayor and I were talking about this ahead of time, and I'm not speaking for Stuart, but I think we both feel the burden to make sure that the product that goes to the city council has been thoroughly reviewed and vetted. So that it's not just a pro forma approval on our part and sent on. I know we'll have an opportunity to discuss it again later, but I don't think we feel that that's a thorough review on the part of this body. I don't think we want to have to jump in later. I think this is our time. We are the, we are the master plan experts in the city. We're the ones, at least at this point, charged by the statute for the review. So that's where we're coming from. So I'd like to hear from, from the others. Mayor. Yeah, so, I mean, I was talking with the chairman. I'm, I'm on the steering committee, but, you know, some of this stuff, 
you know, I was wondering the same things. Where, where did some of this stuff come from? Um, you know, the special projects, yeah, your council member Sage will say, yeah, that's been, I've had to make some uncomfortable votes on, on some of this stuff that I haven't really wanted to do. But at the same time, I, I think it's okay to have to make those votes. Um, and so to me, my first thought was, okay, is it, this is going away. Well, what, what's going to replace it? Well, I hear tonight, it's it's going to be like, you know, it's going, be, zoning. it's going to be zoned so perfectly that, yeah. and then if it's not, then we change the zoning. That that seems problematic to me that we're going to change the zoning. So so I mean I have issues with that. Um, tiny homes, I'm, I, I'm just against that. So I mean I, you know, I hate to vote move a document forward where something I. So I'm supposed to vote yes on something I'm going to then vote no on? I mean, I understand that's the process, I guess. It's kind of an odd process to me. And, you know, I, I, I had some time, so I, you know, went through this. And, I mean, I have just, you know, page 33 through 36 I don't think should be there, page 115, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. I mean, I have some issues with some of those proposals. In my opinion, um, so it's hard to vote. But you know, I, I understand the city manager saying the process is to push this forward to start the clock. But then, if you want to push it forward to start the clock, if you have issues with it, so you know that that's kind of where where I am. I, mean, I voted last time to move forward under the guise of to start the clock, but. Kind of in retrospect, um, it, it seems harder to do that tonight. I have a question, and I and I understand the spot that you're in. You know, it's kind of you can't really talk about it unless we say, "Yeah, go ahead." And you know, we're mm -hmm. kind of stuck in a in a box here. But if there is obviously concern about certain changes that are in this document, and I think you're hearing them kind of loud and clear, is there a mechanism or a procedure for those to be? taken out or modified and then brought back so then you might get a more favorable response from the Planning Commission to flick the switch and start the clock that's what I'm hoping these meetings are for yes. so when okay. you say so yeah so I'm 36 through 33 through 36 Stuart, would tell you us mind what's wrong with it. let's that talk so about it <laughs> so that she can uh, if you want I so mean, that Michelle can I mean this is our only it. forum right. as a public body yep. so I can't do I it via it. email or any other no, way and I understand and I think yeah. if if there was Clearly, yeah. special projects. I yeah, I suspect there's That's universal disdain for yeah. that change. Right. Okay. Absent something, yeah. something that dramatic that comes forward, like a PUD or something like that. But I mean, it would have to be. Again, that's that, that's fine. I know past councils have, uh, due to the difficulty. But again, yeah. if this this group is forwarding mm -hmm. it on, and if this council, you know, again. They can, and the public can give us uh, feedback. You know, I think you know probably Vidya or Nick can also comment. Probably close to ninety percent of communities don't have the special right. project tool. Um, it's not to say, and again, we're a unique, unique community. We've used it well. Um, I, I will say, we'll put council, you know, in that awkward spot from it time does. to time. Right. And if those individuals are comfortable doing it and making those decisions, which again they're le elected to do, so I hope they will. Um, it, it's fine, and if this group wants to make you know add that in or take anything out, to me these meetings would be the one for us to literally pull out the 136 that's, pages. That's exactly why and start we're not crossing right. these things out or adding things in. Just bless it, and move it forward. Yeah. We don't want to talk about it later. We want to yeah, let's talk, talk about, about it now. now. Okay, mm -hmm. so I guess just from my perspective, if we're going to do kind of line item veto type stuff, yeah, yeah. then I would say, <laughs> you know, remove the any type of suggestion that special projects is not going to be part of the future master plan and, and just from a personal perspective i don't see tiny homes as a viable uh solution to the housing crisis that may or may not exist in the city of rochester so i would remove that line item as well is, is, that is there because, consensus on the tiny homes well, I, I, absolutely well, I, I would ask a question why is it that you don't like the concept of what it architecturally looks like or do you just uh want people who would likely move into that good to go into a multi-family high-rise structure it, it's it 
it's more about the architectural and the the aesthetic and the and the, the density of little houses all together. I don't think it it fits the nature of the neighborhood and the and the characteristics of of the city. Frankly, it's, it has nothing to do with you know anything other than just an aesthetic and 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 frankly the location. I'm having a hard time. We talked about that Solaronics. It was going to be a storage unit the last time they were here so there's not a lot of places i think that would be suitable for that and i just don't personally i don't see it as a, as a viable option but that's i'd rather that, that if somebody me. came up with one they brought it in as a special project <laughs> yeah. fair enough and it could happen yeah. it could happen if they make a compelling case it could happen solaronics you know and mr chairman it can happen right now without calling it tiny houses the ordinance allows for a house to be down to a certain minimal mm -hmm. square foot, and that's pretty tiny. I think it's 600 square feet or 650 square And deed feet. restrictions may have something to do with that, I too. think if you're building, a, like, a development of tiny houses, though, you're probably going to want to put more than one on a <laughs> lot, which would well, ordinance they, fine they, for they, that. The one that was a whole lot of money for you heard more. Right. Right. You're probably talking 10, 20. I don't remember the quantum, but it was a lot. It, it just, you know, I know that we need a diversity of uh, uh, people who live here at different um, income levels. Of course. Right, hundred percent. So, the challenge is, is how do we fit them in the community? Sure. Uh, is tiny houses, is it apartments, and then you get sometimes large developments that not all of us agree with mm -hmm. uh, that end up as <laughs> special projects. Right. So. Just a second, underscore my point, and then try to make a second ago. We currently have that. You can do a what I'll call a tiny house based on ordinance minimums right now, and it's multifamily. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't be individual homes. It would. And I don't think that's what you're suggesting, right? You're saying multiple units combined. Just in, well, the, you, in this, oh, I think it could be. A, I think it could be a street of tiny homes, yeah. right, okay. on their own separate they're not lot. Apartments. They're, okay. they're like they look like little single family homes. I got you. I also, didn't, I might see her on wheels, said, but, but they're like 300 square feet. Is, is that a trend you're seeing officially, oh, yes. and we're just the outlier? That's a tiny I mean, it's a, it's a big conversation. I wouldn't say that I'm necessarily seeing cities um, embracing that option. And it's largely because in built-out cities, it doesn't fit into the character because it's never been done before. You so know where I've seen argument. it a lot? Seen it with my eyes? Florida. Yeah. Florida. But, because I mean, the demand for housing right. is so great and the prices are so high that I've, I've seen a lot of it down there. I have a hard time believing that. Putting a bunch of tiny homes up is more affordable than if we're trying to, you know, for affordable housing mm -hmm. and more sustainable than some sort of smaller scale multifamily brownstone townhomes. Yeah, I would agree. And my understanding too is these houses are portable in a sense. Well, a lot of them that they I've seen down there are on wheels. Right. I mean, obviously, we can, I don't want to debate it too much tonight, but you know, the idea of, of building a house and then, you know, picking it up and moving it out is just, it doesn't. It's not hitting a chord with me. That may be right for some city, but and, and I don't I, think this is the one. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. Okay. Mr. Mayor, why, would you go through that list? Well, for the well I would, Michelle but I mean, do we? Do we want to not? Do we want to have a, a different meeting? I mean, I don't. I know it's getting late. Our next meeting is October fourth. Could we then come back and give you our? Line oh yeah, I, <laughs> we definitely need another meeting to discuss right. this, and the agenda is going to have to be such that we have the time to do it. Sure, I think we could all, all come very well prepared uh, with our points of view. And uh, by the end of the meeting, hopefully have shaken the can down to where we have a, the ability to come up with a new product that we can move forward. We're basing it off of the current version in our hand? I think so, but also the existing master plan. You know, don't feel afraid to move back to what exists now versus what's proposed. I think you need them both. I think in a lot of cases... What I've heard is that go back to the original and probably leave it alone. You know, it's, it can survive another five years. That, that section or that statement can survive another five years. Can that, I ask a question as it relates to this? I saw the Mill Street, um, you know, kind of called out, highlighted here. I know that land has typically been used for our winter festival. Is that city land or is that open for development and that's somebody's allowed? private property. It is private, but it's yeah. been allowed to be used. Right. Well, correct. Right. I mean, that's that was one of my issues. Not, not to, with all three of those sites. With, with all three of those sites is the, that, that's private property. We, we, 
in my opinion, we shouldn't be publishing this document. I mean, that'd be like me publishing something and you're using your house <laughs> a, as an example. Well, that's well, there's that Mill is, Street and Dillman Upton, and what was the third one? Oh, the, uh, the one on the hill below. Right, the so that's all private property that yeah. we're sitting here. Which has an approved site plan on. Right, right. right. We're, that we're talking about what our, we're going to do with that is, property when it's private property. That and seems the Woodward plan is already in there when we yeah. have not had uh, any Mr. discussion. Mr. Dillman, no, that we're <laughs> Exactly, yeah. Yes. Can I address that comment? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. Because I, I think you brought it up last time, and um, mm -hmm. I understand the concern. I will say that this approach... Um, to visioning on a transformational site. So in, not just a single family parcel, but a parcel that has the potential to have a large impact. Um, this has become a new sort of more proactive way of thinking about development that's actually backed by MEDC. If you guys have heard of the RRC project, I do this in communities all over uh, the state. So I do understand it, it might look as if we're undermining a private property owner rights, but we're really just saying that this property, while it is owned by someone who can do whatever they'd like with it within uh, zoning, um, <laughs> we've gotten together as a community and said, if this site becomes available, this is what we want to see here. And so Could that you bring way us some backup from MEDC? Sure which shows that in communities are encouraged to do that? Yeah, absolutely. It, it's in we their best practices. We don't want to be seen by any of those three property owners as striking out on our own, influencing them. Maybe they have something else in mind. Somewhere down the road we deny maybe what they want to do, and and they sue us because, well, well yeah. you, and you I, preempted I was, us with yeah. what I, I'm, I, I'm not even thinking legally. I'm just thinking... I, it just I, seems inappropriate to me. I think well, Woodward, just, it's, not, it's not nice either, right? I, mean, I, I think the Woodward site is the most, like, problemsome offensive. and offensive because you have a long-standing, you know, business. Right. They're big supporters of the community mm -hmm. to show that we'd recommend like redeveloping that. that yeah, is, would you mind? Uh, I just, <laughs> yeah, that I absolutely has to I don't go. care. There's some, no, no, no again, nothing. Personal. I didn't select. I'm not offended. I'm here to listen. Just because Just some form. zoning or some planning something says it's With a good thing to do, I... that doesn't appear to me to be. Again, my opinion. Just but may I ask the, the commission what you have a fundamental problem with suggesting to a property owner what would be a good use for the community? Not in the master plan. I, that's I the think purpose especially where of the master an plan business. is to coordinate and think about development. I don't see it in the master plan. Where I think, do you see it? Because we can take it out. We've already done the work, so you have the information. You could use it internally if you'd like, but the purpose of a master plan is to think about future development and coordinate it. So I think we're prepared that uh, if Dillman and Upton said, we're going out of business next week, can't take the competition anymore, we're moving on, Yeah. that we're prepared to discuss with them what we would love as a community. And that's what this, I guess that's what I'm saying, is that's what you could bring to them. But, but I not in the master plan. I think okay, so, you're saying so, so if I'm the guy that owns Solaronics right across yeah. the street from them, yeah. I'm going to ask you, why don't you talk to me? Yeah. Why did you select yeah, me I as one of the business? I've been able to sell this for right. two years. Yeah. So, yeah, that's kind so of... So I understand, right. So, okay. so, there's that, so there's that issue. You know, you, you know, we could have picked a school building, right, which is... <laughs> In at theory, least gonna it's be, public. Yeah. yeah, you know, I mean, <laughs> at least it's public property, yeah. school building, RCS is. I think the right. conversations yeah. that you're looking at are more informal over a cup of coffee, yeah. saying, "Hey, if you ever think about selling that building, we've got some ideas." And I think once you broadcast it publicly for the entire city to see and other people, it gives this individual owner. Hey, what's going on that I don't know about? Yeah. Are they talking behind my back? And what's the big idea? And I just, I, I think it, okay. I understand your position, but I think it creates more harm and detriment. Mm. Than well, we're than publishing this. this, we're sending this document all over I get, yeah. our area. That's right. <laughs> right. Now, so, all the surrounding communities, right. all the other yeah. levels of government. I, so we're not comfortable. I don't think it would hurt for us to have something that showcases what a development could look like, having ideas, Theoretical. Of a mix yes. of different housing. Theoretical, not tied to a specific Correct. property. I think that's... Yes, agreed. It's like there are a lot of larger industrial properties in the city that are going to 
uh, go away in time, especially on South Street, bigger than Dillman Upton. But that discussion in that particular area would probably be good. We're just worried about the private <coughs> property right. rights of the individuals. At least change the header from community preferences to <laughs> yeah. something <laughs> softer. <laughs> I, I will note, I just attended today at the, the Michigan Municipal League, and actually uh, they went through this. The, the three examples that they show from 2019, 2020, and 2021 all did have this properties in those communities, and they've included it. it it's not a requirement by the state yet. The, they have a checklist, and it's now an asterisk is a recommended. But again, if this body does not want to include it in there, uh, it's not a requirement, so it can easily just be scratched. Again, the work I, has been I done. I would absolutely want to have each of those property owners' permission to do it, but I, I just don't see that in a master plan, something that specific about properties. If it was abandoned, if it was a, uh, a brownfield site, I mean, any number of other things, I could see it, but not these three pieces of property are going to be highly costly and expensive and, and sought after. So I don't think we want to. You guys are the policy, and again, it's not a requirement. So but a general really discussion a with the same, you know, recognizing that the city has a lot of larger, older industrial properties that are going to change in the near future. We'd love that discussion there. I think that would be well, uh, well received. Well, again, uh, maybe to your point, maybe more generic. Uh, in, in nature, um, and maybe that's a good transition as, as it does, I will say, it looks like the trend will be in the future. It might be for us 10, 15 years down the road it to have, uh, but more generic, and then maybe also the future uh, land use might be another appropriate place other than the master okay. plan to actually have, you know. Back to you. Yeah, so I, I won't go through <laughs> my list, but okay. so, a so, so a couple things is, in the, in the recommended changes and in some of these action strategies, it talks about the, map, the um, special projects. It talks about tiny houses. So, I mean, you have to go in and if you take it out here, you got to take it out yep. further, further along. Okay. And then, and, and I guess the theme I had is it seems to me like we're trying to you know, this sounds more philosophical. We're, we're we're trying to, instead of letting the the market determine things, which and I believe the market has done an excellent job in the city of Rochester, right? Our property values are all up. We think we have a great city. The free market has done a good job with with us, the planning commission, zoning, taking care of it. To me, a lot of the stuff in here, or some of the stuff in here, seems like we're we're trying to engineer an outcome, which I don't think we need to be doing. Can you be more specific? Mm -hmm. uh -oh. I'd love an example so I can um, take a look at the action plan. You know, adopt a climate action plan that includes a greenhouse gas inventory to establish an emissions baseline and benchmark reduction every five years. Mm -hmm. that's, so that's part of the new sustainability section that was yeah. added to the um, Move away from special project. Use sole smart resource to pursue designations. Um, I mean, just there's a list of that. And again, this is just my, my opinion. We don't know what that means, so we're not comfortable with sending it on. Convert, convert the city's vehicle fleet to electric vehicles. Well, we have one, but, I mean, are we really going to do that? Do we need to do that, or is is there infrastructure for that? Where's you know, electricity coming from? It's right, really we can't keep our environmentally but friendly. In the <laughs> right, right. so so again, just I, I'm those are the kind of things. And then when we get to the housing, um, you know, I mean, like I say, I just have you know transition to cellular based parking payment. I mean, are we That's really from the sub consultants? Yeah, study. we're gonna. Um, and I, I, I'm, I know you don't want to hear these, but I'm... I'm no, I need to hear what them. Does I'm that the mean, one changing them. What does that mean differently than what we do now? Since I don't know what that means, cellular-based parking. So thing. you'd have an app on your phone yeah, we where do you now. could pay? Yeah. In neighborhoods where it is undesirable for a home to be torn down and replaced by a larger home, adjust the zoning to closely match the bulk requirements with the built environment. Right, so that is in reference to these... Big massive housing. homes right. being built on tiny lots. Right. 
what I'm just saying is that's the market. That's that's what the market has done. I I have them on my street. I you know maybe didn't like it, but it's the free market and our Your housing, housing values gone up. R right. right. So yeah. so so I'm just saying. So I see a lot of those in there that. I guess I don't. I don't personally agree with, and, and so. But I. I certainly want to hear other people's views. But so, so those are the kind of things. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Maybe the 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 action plan should be as we all go back and kind of come back with eight or nine things, or however many things yeah. that we think, mm -hmm. and we present them at the next meeting and say, and then maybe there's some overlap, you know, so there's not 90 different things, but we yeah. all come back and have a conversation once we can digest this a little bit more. This was very helpful. Yep. The, 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 what you prepared I think for we us, asked for that the last time, yeah. and that has mm -hmm. been very helpful yeah. to us. Great. I mean, yeah. Seriously, this was, this was good. So I think maybe that's what I would do personally, is go back and say, okay, what what's what's a hard no, what's I need some help with, and what's, okay, these are these are completely fine. Okay, so next meeting we'll be ready to discuss all of this. Absolutely. We'll, okay. s we'll set aside the time to do that. If okay. I could suggest so that we're not continuing to bring her and have the expense of, of right. having her come out and sure. come back yeah. and, and, and do this again, if we maybe could set a deadline to have uh, staff, uh, Sienna, actually get everybody's comments yeah. so we can get those we'll to that. her uh, ahead of time. And so she might be able to say, you know, eight out of nine commissioners have, you know, want special projects. And so then it's a, a fairly easy conversation. And then she can. So would you work with Sienna, decide yeah, which definitely. agenda it's going to go on, and then give sure. us a deadline? Yep, okay. definitely. We can okay. send that out. But we're, but we're not going to send all our stuff to Siona. We're going to talk about it here. Well, you would send it all, and then you guys would have the conversation. Now, instead of Are you okay with that? And they'll hearing, compile us before each, that meeting? Yeah. I think it would just be more efficient if I could see beforehand what okay. the the scale you and know, be prepared of what we're, yeah. and prepare. So yeah. you're not ambushed. Yeah, we well, don't. Want we're that. not ambushed. <laughs> yeah, no, I get it. You want to have a conversation. I want to be able substance. to lead a conversation without having seen everything for the first time. On yeah. The spot. So I hope we didn't possible. ambush you tonight. No, 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 no. I right. think we gave the impression last time that we. Well, I don't think we under. Or at least I didn't understand when we'd have the dialogue about these right. items and everything. So. When would the next meeting be? That so because what I want to do is make sure I, we have enough time, or at least I have enough time to give you the information so you can go through it and have the most productive. Not the first one in October. Yeah. I don't think no, that's enough. No, I don't enough think time. so because generally your packets probably come out like a week beforehand, and I'd like probably a week to look at it beforehand. So uh, maybe if I can, if I can interject, Michelle, I'm please, tired. please. Um, yeah, so the meeting on the 4th, I do not suggest at all. Um, I would like to suggest possibly getting uh, the information perhaps by the second meeting in October, which is the 21st of October. Could we um, devote most of that meeting then, the 21st of October, to this subject? I know there, so there are always I'm, emergencies. That's what that's what I was going to propose. Okay. So I would state that the next meeting, I guess the next week, maybe by the 8th, everybody can turn their comments into me, and then we can have Michelle look at them, and then the meeting on the 21st of October, we can address and go by these items and go through it. So Sienna will send them to you? Yes. I'll send an email tomorrow to everyone. Okay, good. Thank you. Can I make a Please. suggestion or maybe a request for the next pack meeting? Maybe we don't need another reprint. No, don't don't yeah. don't reprint this. Reprint. I mean, something's going to change. Yeah, the, yeah. So I just yeah. I don't want to get another pack with the exact yeah. same yeah. 130 page yeah. color. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, and Let's and I and I might just suggest these action plans on page 116 and on are kind of good. There's four or five, six pages. Those are good things to, I think, take a look I at. I think you could start there, and then if you're like, what is that? Anything that's in the action plan is talked about in the plan. And right. so they're under the specific right. headers. So the sustainability one, for example, mm -hmm. if you're like, what is this? If you go to that section, you can skim through, right. see if it's addressed the way that you'd like it to be. So, yeah, probably start with the action plan, and then you can work backwards. Okay. All right. We're comfortable with that? Yes. Yes. All right. I don't think we need a motion. Quick question. Michelle, thank you very much.
quick question. Would it be helpful for us to print out the current one so that you guys can be comparing? I, I just can want you to email make, it to us. Yeah. We, it's electronic on our website. We can have Sienna the actually send, yeah, the, the that works. send you the link. Yeah. Just send the link, please. Okay. Yeah. Great. I just want you guys to have everything. I think so it's you can very important to look at them both. Yep. The, for, the existing plan is quite good. I, we I understand. We spent quite a bit old. of time on that one as well. So. Yeah. Plus, we have the summary of changes. The summary the of changes, changes there is great. Which hopefully, I found that very helpful as we were working. It, it is very helpful. Yeah. So, great. Thank you both. We appreciate it. Uh, number five, miscellaneous. Does anyone at this hour have any miscellany? I have one quick one. Yes, sir. I just wanted to remind everybody here that October 6th is the state of the city ah. at the community house and we'll be talking about stuff that's been going on here so if people can attend that'd be great very good you're all invited I think it's so. well, thank you <laughs> are your handlers uh, writing the speech right now uh, yeah my, my handlers <laughs> at uh, handler. my computer, computer. My, hand, my handle. <laughs> we look forward to that. Thank you. Sianna, number seven, upcoming agenda items for October 4th. Yes, so it, it, it will be the consideration of a site plan to 174 new carports at Forrester Department located at 425 West 2nd Street. Okay. Nick, are you still there? I am. We spent a lot of time talking about this, I don't know, six, eight weeks ago when the this applicant came in. I, yep. I, I assume you've made our those comments known. I did, and quite frankly, they're plowing ahead how they want to plow ahead. That's their right. Okay. We'll want to know uh, very clearly that doesn't what our sound encouraging, does it? <laughs> in terms of how we handle that. Uh, if we have any latitude or if it's by right. So we, we need to know that. Okay. Um, any other any other business? I'm happy to say this meeting is adjourned. Thank you for your patience. Thank you. Good night, everyone.